Hello everybody, welcome to this session that is Barriers to Leg Health. This is a Haddenham sponsored session and we're really proud to support Legs Matter and Legs Matter Week. Everybody's out and about doing their bits to raise awareness. My name's Natalie Phillips and I'm Clinical Manager at Haddenham Healthcare and I'm here with my lovely colleagues. Um, so go for it and introduce yourself. Becky. Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us. My name is Becky Alwell. I'm the Lymphedema Advanced Nurse Practitioner at the Royal Stoke University Hospital and a proud trustee of the British Lymphology Society. Hi guys, I'm Tess Henry and I am Community Clinical Manager for Haddenham Healthcare. Uh, my background is tissue viability and uh, lymphedema specialist nurse. So lovely to be with you this evening. Thank you both. Thank you. And I should have said I'm a lymphedema nurse specialist as well. So uh, I am just going to sort out sharing my screen, but I do want to encourage everybody. This We will try and make this interactive. So do post questions in the Q&A or, or the chat and we may choose to answer them as we go along um, if we remember to look at it and or we may just wait until the end. So I'm going to share, and hopefully that's sharing, I think it is. Um, so this session is really about barriers to leg health. Um, it's come about because over the years, we have all had many, many discussions on the types of patients that we see and lots of them come into clinic or lots of people will come into clinic and have not received adequate care or will have not had enough access to care so we really wanted to just use this time to highlight what those barriers might be um and hopefully sort of um just increase awareness of how to ac access correct information for products and the correct products for patients along that journey and just discuss some of the barriers to ongoing supported self-management as well. Over to Beck. Hi, thanks Natalie. Thanks for introducing the session and what we hope to um, share with you and that you will get out of it. So I think uh, What's really exciting um, to be with you as part of Lymphedema Awareness Week, uh, sorry, as, as Legs Matter Awareness Week, um, is that we are um, hoping very much that by joining us, we're going to be um, having an interactive discussion. As Natalie said, we really want to hear your take on this. This isn't about what we think. This is about what you think. Um, and it's all about promoting that um, number of free resources that are available for you on the Legs Matter website, the number of um, coalition partners and um, resources that are available um, and also um, with having had them here today, the fantastic teaching and training um, that's available through um, our industry partners. There is um, nice guidance, there's innovation, there's research, there's multiple publications that we need to uh, make sure that we're aware of and abreast of uh, and be critiquing um, and for those of us as lymphedema specialists within the audience, um, although this session of course is focused on uh, lower limb wounds and um, there's also a real focus um, on lymphedema um, and chronic edema um, and I think that whether you are a patient with a wound um, or a lower limb condition or whether you're a healthcare professional what we really hope is that um, we are starting to get across the message that we need to act now we need to become the change makers um, we need to not ignore any longer um, those things that may once have been barriers to treatment, which is what we're here for tonight. So if we notice a little bit of swelling um, that's not causing any particular harm, we should still be advocating and picking up on that and being that champion. If there's a small amount of leakage of lymph through the skin from a tiny spot, we should still be picking up on not ignoring that. We should be listening to patients' cues. I can't get my shoes on. I, I can't wear the clothes that I want to wear. I'm embarrassed by the appearance of my legs. These must not be ignored. We need to think about what we can do as generalists. So we don't need specialists to provide lymphedema management in the main part. We need to be um, encouraging everyone to do their bit. And that's us as patients as well. We are um, patients ourselves. We're patients of the future. And we need to be actively seeking 
taking care and shouting loudly if we're not getting it because we, we really deserve it. Everyone is working together to try and raise the profile of uh, the lower limb, raise the profile of legs and feet and raise the profile of wounds um, and chronic edema. Uh, and I think that for us, we hope to get across today that there are chronic edema patients in the absence of a wound that maybe as healthcare professionals, some of you won't get to see, um, but this is really important. We've got to start somewhere. We've got to be brave um, and make waves. And even if we only make ripples, uh, it's, a, it's a good start. So next slide, please, Nat. So we know that um, a huge amount of the patients that are seen in the community have chronic edema alongside their wound, 56.7% um, in Moffat's study. Um, and we know that this is not the primary reason that most people are seen. So their chronic edema is like an incidental finding, like somebody who goes for a chest x-ray or CT and something else um, is found. Um, but What's really important um, is honing in on the cause of the swelling and or the wound. So we know from guest study that actually there was a, a significant failure to identify the cause um, of the wound. And we know that's the same for the swelling. We know that it's often not understood why a patient's developed swelling. And if we as healthcare professionals don't understand it, how on earth can we understand it ourselves as patients, as relatives, um, as those of us who are at risk? If the rec correct cause can be identified, then the correct treatment pathway can be implemented promptly and efficiently. And that's what we're all about, getting it right first time. We need to stop thinking about chronic edema and lymphedema as separate entities. We know they're the same thing and we need to stop using that terminology, which is confusing and seems to allude to needing specialist care. We need to stop talking about lymphorrhea as leakage of lymph through the skin as if it was different to a wound. It is a wound, it is a breach in the skin integrity and therefore deserves the same treatment as any other lower limb wound. And we need to stop thinking about wounds and chronic edema or lymphedema as separate things again. It's one thing in those uh, people who've got both. If I have uh, a swollen ankle and a leg wound, I don't want you to say, well, I could look after this bit, but I need to get somebody else to look after that bit. Uh, I want you to know what's the right thing, even if I need referral on in due course. The recognition um, and the um, credence of importance I want given um, to the things that I'm complaining of, the things that concern me. Next slide, please, now. So... Legs Matter as um, a, a campaign are dedicated and committed um, to moving forward their 10 point plan. And we need to think as healthcare practitioners and as patients, what is harm? What can be considered as harm within lower limb care? And first of all, we need to acknowledge that things we probably thought about previously as omissions of care. Um, so things like delayed assessment, inadequate assessment, um, failure to refer on. That is actually a harm because it means that there's a delay then in the ongoing management or uh, achieving the correct management. So we know that that lack of um, instigating evidence-based care quickly and efficiently um, can be seen as harm. The Legs Matter campaign is dedicated to supporting the National Wound Care Strategy's implementation of first aid, necessary care, immediately so that we are not waiting for a vascular assessment we're not waiting for somebody else who knows more about this particular um, set of uh, symptoms that the person has but actually about all of us taking responsibility for moving that person forward to have that immediate and necessary care we need to think about our terminology we need to think about um, what we talk about when we talk about um, lymphedema and swelling we need to think about reduction primarily but also long-term control long-term control so that the symptoms are alleviated to the best of our ability and then with wounds we need to talk about he healing a clear trajectory and referral on in the absence um, of healing to ensure that we have the right people at the right time to make sure the right outcome and quality of life is there um, for the patient we need to be thinking about harm in a lack of compression or an inadequate level of compression or an inadequate choice of compression. We need to be thinking about it in terms of the foot in inadequate offloading or pressure redistribution. These things can be seen as harm, things that we maybe wouldn't have termed of that previously. 
the Legs Matter 10 point plan is clear. We are highlighting, raising awareness and driving the agenda to acknowledge these things as harm. But also as individuals, as members of the public, as patients, as patients of the future, we need to know our rights. We have a right to be listened to. This is point six. Follow our cues. Listen to us, please. We need to achieve that immediate and necessary care. Point three. We need to um, be safe. So we want our practitioners not to be um, wildly applying immediate and necessary care. We want it to be safe in the absence of red flags, so things like infection or chronic limb ischemia um, and uh, DVT and skin cancers. We need to be thinking about safety always. But as patients, we deserve our lymphedema or chronic edema to be controlled. We deserve our wound to move towards healing wherever possible. And we should expect to have evidence-based care at all times. We should be able to ask questions. Why are you doing that? Why have I got this? And we should have a thorough answer so that we understand why it's important to do simple things like, why is it important to elevate our legs and go to bed at night? What difference does it make? I'm comfortable in my recliner chair. We need to have our answers ready to be able to empower each other and patients. We need to think about having protocols locally to address gaps in knowledge and skills. We know that not everyone has the necessary skills or lacks confidence to, to address um, more specific areas of lower limb care. We need to think about when we refer on, what are those priority areas? Where do we pick up on those? Where do we challenge and move things forward? And it's not about just challenging our own practice. It's about challenging the practice of others and challenging the status quo within our organizations or within uh, professions that we're working with to really make that change and make a system change. Because eventually without standardization and without that lack of system change, we're unlikely to see um, a movement forward in the way in which the campaign from Legs Matter is helping us um, to drive that agenda. So all of us can make those ripples um, and start to, to, to shout for us, for our family and for um, the wider public uh, uh, as our patients. Next slide, please, Nat. So accessing information, there is a plethora of information out there, as we've said. There are high level um, uh, research studies. There are um, studies and trials that we're waiting for results on. There are um, nice guidance relating to compression products. There is information about skin care from all of these coalition partners, including industry and the National Wound Care Strategies Lower Limb Recommendations, that if you're not aware of each of these organizations' information, you need to make yourself aware of them. As a patient, a lot of this information information is public facing, um, or if it's for your family member, or if it's for you as a practitioner, you really need to upskill. There's a huge amount of information that's very readable, easy, sometimes in electronic formats um, that you need to make sure you're aware of. We haven't the time to go through all of these things today, um, but they are essential that you are keeping abreast um, of movement of this evidence and this um, uh, information because it's changing all the time. Next slide now. So a brief um, final slide for me, the overview, the journey of the person with the venous leg ulcer um, with or without lymphedema. Um, and so what's important here is that we follow the existence. We follow nice guidance. We follow things that we've learned from high levels of research. We follow the National Wound Care Strategies Lower Limb Recommendations. If there's a patient with a wound with swelling, we still need to be addressing both areas. Of course, we should move forward to that wound assessment and following local guidance for wound management. Uh, and which will include a vascular assessment, we very much hope, um, and compression, which may need to start at a lower level, given the immediate and necessary care, and then be titrated up to a therapeutic level. We should be looking for that healing and prevention of uh, recurrence. And we know that this is largely our community colleagues that are, be going, are, are going to deal with this group of patients. But the patients with chronic edema without a wound, we know it's much harder for these patients to access care. There are not lymphedema services in every area. There are not lymphedema services that accept patients with a high BMI um, or with certain diagnoses. And so again, we're hoping that our GPs, that our practice nurses, that any healthcare professional that's coming into contact with someone with lower limb swelling will follow those cues rather than thinking, it's not my job, it's not my area of expertise. We're relying 
relying on um, supportive care. We're relying on carers out in the community, um, pharmacists, anybody who patients might ask questions of. Um, and we want to move those patients forward to achieve a, an assessment of their edema, um, just like a wound assessment would be, um, and then to move forward to adequate and appropriate therapeutic levels of compression for symptom reduction and long-term management. The British Lymphology Society and other organisations, including Legs Matter on their web pages, have lots of information about lymphedema. Um, and please do get in touch with, through the frequently asked questions, through the contact us boxes, if you're not able to provide the support. But please do remember that ignoring those cues, ignoring that little bit of edema is actually something we can consider as a mission of care and thus harm. Thank you. Can I just um, interject as well, Beck? I think it's um, that going back to discussions we've had when we were discussing this session and, and saying that as much as a patient may have a wound on one leg, if they've got edema on the other, the other leg needs treating as well. So it's, it's that looking at the legs as a whole and not just, and we'll touch upon it in a bit, not just looking at the area where the wound is looking at the whole limb so so yes thank you thank you for that um i'm going to move the slide forward for tess <laughs> thank you thank you very much so um i have the pleasure of sharing with you this evening um looking at different types of compression so um, I'm so glad I was given uh, the next three slides to talk you through because it's my air, one of my areas of passion. Um, and I guess one of the biggest things, I spend a lot of time in community in my current role, uh, teaching, training, joint patient visits. Um, and the biggest challenge that I have with around compression is they won't concord, they, they won't comply. And I love it actually now when people say that because I say to them, there are so many products out there that you have available to you that it would be near on impossible to not find some suitable compression um, for any of your patients for that matter. And I know we're going to talk in a moment about some of those barriers. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to give you some guidance as to how you might be able to overcome that the, those barriers. And of course, utilizing the Legs Matter 10 point plan. Honestly, it's the best template to kind of guide you through um, obstacles that you may face. But looking at this generically um, and when you would use each of these products. So I always like to talk generically because there are so many companies and so many products um, and so much marketing that we can really, really get confused. So I think if you can try and educate yourselves on the basics. So, for example, you know, when we would use um, bandaging, what type of bandaging do we want to use? You know, what type of bandaging do we have access to? At what state of the wound or uh, lymphedema, chronic edema, edema, um, what stage are we actually looking to bandage and what are we actually trying to achieve? So what resources do we have available to us around the types of bandages that we're doing um, and looking at the most effective options ultimately for the goals of your patient. You know, I mean, that's one of the first things that we should be asking is, is our patients, what's important to you? Um, and that's, you know, all based around this supported self-care. So we used to say self-care, now we like to say supported self-care which is far more appropriate um, because we don't want our patients to feel like they're ever alone so you've got a variety of options as i've just alluded to so you've got your leg ulcer kits you've got uh just all velcro wrapping devices uh wrapping systems you've got um a just or oh, i've just said that adjustable velcro wrapping devices we've got two there so we've got below knee we've got knee and we've also got um um thigh so i know that several of you um are not necessarily used to bandaging above the knee but if you think about it and think about the concept of managing the whole leg the whole limb so wherever there is edema wherever there is swelling 
we need to compress those areas so a couple of the things that i frequently see in the community is um patients with a huge dorsum of their foot or edematous toes or wet toes um and the the question that i'm often asked is what dressings can i put on this and it's like well you know first of all the fluid that's leaking out is actually lymph so it doesn't matter what you put on from a wound care perspective the only thing that's going to reverse this is graduated compression so i guess the message i'm trying to get across to you is wherever there is edema we need compression um, so for example you have the availability of toe caps so once upon a time we used to toe bandage um, we rarely do that some specialist services do still toe bandage but in the community setting we've got the wonderful addition of sized toe cap garments so for example the Hadnam microfine toe cap was one of the first um, off the shelf sized um, toe caps available to us um, <clears throat> but one point that I do want to make about specifically the microfine toe cap it's really important that they are cut to size so when i say cut to size not the patient's foot but the actual garment so we need to make sure that it's a it's a standard size they you know they're what do you call it ambidextrous so both uh, one they're not left and right is what i'm trying to say so you need to cut the length of of the um toe caps where you want them to be and most people are on board with that they're okay with that but the other most common thing that i see in areas that uh, use a lot of microfine toe caps is the toe cap must sit flat along the dorsum of the foot because if you have rolling you're actually going to create a tourniquet effect and so the one thing you're trying to do to move the fluid, you're actually going to block it. So critical, critical that you do cut to size. Um, again, a moment ago, I mentioned about um, uh, bandaging below the knee. So if we have edema around the knee, and I know that you all see this, um, but we don't know how to manage it. So because no one's spoken to us about that, we don't know what compression to use, we tend to leave it. But remember, we're asking our patients to move around. We're saying, you know, if you can stand up, even if you can't walk, stand and do some leg exercises. But if they, they can't bend their knees because of the edema, um, you know, we're, we're asking them the impossible. So be creative in your choices you know we've got phenomenal products out there now um with like the easy wrap um knee and thigh it's um you know it's specifically designed uh so that patients can bend their you know bend their knees and provide that compression and they're great to be used in conjunction with below knee bandaging you can use them combined when you're moving on to hosiery, you have the option of circular knit and flat knit. Um, you also have the option of um, a very unique product, um, Comfy Wave, which can be used for nighttime compression, but it's actually being used far more widely than just nighttime compression. So it's a class one compression garment that is so easy to don and off and so comfortable for patients to wear. So you get where I'm going with this as far as, um, you know, there are so many different compression options and access, utilize, um, you know, your industry partners and the clinical advisors within those um, industry with with those industry partners as well. Um, you're never alone. Never alone. Next slide, please. Thank you. <laughs> um, oh, another one of my hot topics, barriers to obtaining correct products. Um, this is a huge one. I've just spent two days training uh, nurses from primary care and community um, and, you know, barriers. Honestly, I think we could have spent a half a day talking about barriers to obtaining the correct products. So um, it is critical that we have access um, to evidence based care treatment plans uh, to promote healing and improve quality of life. And essentially, as Becky just said, you know, this references to point four in the Legs Matter 10 point plan, which is why I'm saying it's a fantastic tool to have. 
um, if you go through all of those points individually and ask yourself the question, am I actually, am I doing this? Mm -hmm. um, if you're not doing it and you don't feel confident to do, to deliver the evidence-based evidence care that you want to deliver, manage up. So when I say manage up, don't be afraid to ask the question, challenge the status quo. You know, we've got so much evidence and support out there. And National Wound Care Strategy Programme came about because, you know, because of the, the work from Julian Guest. So we know that we are being supported. So at a local level, it is more difficult. You know, we have challenges um, procuring the, the hosiery. So another common problem. Well, we order through the pharmacy and, you know, the patient hasn't received the garments four to six months after it's been prescribed. Well, by that stage, the compression that you've ordered is probably not appropriate um, or, or it doesn't fit. So it is really important to understand that process. And um, one of the things that I'm a huge um, lover of, endorser of, <laughs> bad grammar there, um, is DAC providers. So pharmacists are amazing at dispensing medication, prescriptions. Compression is a totally different field for them. They are getting better and more involved in understanding the needs of compression and the specialized nature of compression hosiery, et cetera. Um, but we have specialized DAC providers. So there, you know how everybody's promoting these online uh, pharmacy services. So there are a couple of companies um, such as Daylong and Patient Choice where you are the, the GP or you are, if you're a nurse prescriber, are able to send that prescription directly to either of those providers. Um, and because they're specialists in their field with all aspects of compression, your waiting time is dramatically reduced, um, you know, because they're, they're specialists in compression. So um, again, point five, Point eight, again, as I said, you know, don't be afraid to escalate. Um, make sure that you are enhancing your knowledge and skills, you know, for the, for the benefit of the patient, but also health economy. You know, we know we're all under such tight restrictions, budgetary constraints, low staffing issues. So if we all take action um, to just baby steps, baby steps um, and empower yourselves with um, with all of these wonderful support materials pathways um, to to support you we can make such a huge difference and regular evaluation um, of the patient to review progress you know again i understand it's difficult when you know you're seeing a patient today and you might not see that patient again for another five weeks um, but review each patient as if it's the first time you're seeing them. So as if you're doing, you know, we start our observation from the minute we walk into their house, from the minute they walk into our um, GP surgery. So, you know, using all of your skills, you know, looking, listening, watching how they walk. So I'm challenging you to start to look at each patient that you see every single day as if it's the first time you've, you've seen them. So thanks, Nat. Okay, um, so there was we've just got the 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 one more slide. Yeah, um, and I'll be really really quick because I do okay? tend to rave on. Apologies <laughs> for that. So some of the other barriers to prescribing is you know I've already mentioned DAC, so I don't need to go through that again. But it's really difficult to navigate your ways around you know the systems that we use. So System One and EMIS. Um, it's finding. Uh, those products in the system. So a lot of our industry partners, companies um, provide fantastic online resources. So for example, with Haddenham, um, we have a system called a code finder where it's so easy. You simply tick, like, ch click is the word I was meaning, click on the, the garment that you're after. It steps you through the process. It gives you the exact description that you can copy and paste into System One or EMIS. 
um, so you don't have to spend you know half an hour looking for this specific product and it also gives you um, a GP referral letter you can download the um, the measurement form so there's a custom online option as well where you can do your custom online measuring and send that through so utilize um, the support from all of the companies um, that are out there because you know these are barriers that are easy to overcome so you know don't give up oh thank you tess thank you thank i think it is, it's really important isn't it that people everybody understands that the information is there and the products are there it's it's that using i certainly think using some of the dax companies so such as patient choice and day long really does reduce that delay that patients get in in receiving their garments um so yeah so i'm now going to talk for a little bit because i've been sat here really quiet and i actually like you talking <laughs> Um, I am just going to say I haven't been able to put any comments in the Q&A section because I've had to unplug my um, keyboard, but that's another story. OK, so we're going to talk about barriers to continuing care. Now, the one thing I'd like you to tell me if you're going to pop it in the chat is what information do you give your patients when you discharge them um, to support their ongoing care? So um, obviously the, there is a wealth of written information out there that, that I've put some examples up here of, of again, um, questions to ask the GP and the National Wound Care Strategy um, compression document. And I've also put up some um, a lymphedema specific information. But it's really important as well that we back this up with our verbal information on what we expect our patients or what we should do for our long term care. And that should include what what we need to do on a daily basis from getting up in the morning to skincare to popping on our compression, popping on if you can pop it on the, the use of applicators if somebody can't and troubleshooting that. Um, but also sort of what to do during the day. What should the patient do to ensure that they get regular repeat prescriptions? The, the joy of the DAX companies is that they set reminders and they will contact the patient um, at, at, at set intervals when they're due new compression. Um, I also think it's really important that we give our patients the information as it is prescribed, there's an example here on the slide, so that when they get their compression, they can check it is what they should be having. Because mm -hmm. there are lots of times where people are, will get re-referred to clinics and they come in and the hosiery that they've got is not what anybody has requested. It's been substituted by somebody. So, so that's really important. Again, um, information on the care of products, information on skin care, uh, what to do if that um, they get a hole in their compression, how can they get more, and what to do if they are unable to obtain compression. So I think the one point, again, going back to our discussions that we really need to get across is, is for everybody to know that actually you need to initiate a follow-up if we've not been in touch with you. So if you've got a problem and you are unsure what to do, you need to, patients should have those contact details to be able to say, I've got a problem and I, I could do with a follow-up or my wounds reoccurring or my edema's now getting worse and is not maintained. Um, Certainly within my role clinically, I see those people whose edema is not maintained um, and they come to see us um, and it's a private clinic, but they come to see us with swelling that is out of control, but they haven't been able to get access to a clinician to help them with that or 
they are still being prescribed inappropriate products. So I think it's really important to have that information. Tess and Becky have alluded to this. So we're going to talk about some clinical examples. Now here we've got two classic examples of this lady that uh, with the um, large thighs, nobody knew they were there because they didn't ask her to lift her skirt up. So when we're assessing, it's really important that we have a look above knee because especially if there is swelling, if we're not going to treat the thigh, we're likely to just push it up. Tess mentioned about toe swelling. Um, what what we need to have a little discussion about this. What do you think? <laughs> Becky and Tess are <I'm> mute. <laughs> I think it's probably the biggest um, difficulty that I come across um, in the definition of a lower limb. Um, so lower limb for me is from the groin to the tip of the toes, uh, and therefore we should be preventing any edema um, from uh, affecting those areas. If it, if it isn't already there, if it is there, of course, that should be part of our treatment component from the start. Um, and I think that I'm happy to accept that um, a leg and foot in the vast majority of healthcare settings is from the knee down, but the, the lower limb for me is growing to the tip of the toes. Uh, and there's really no excuse. We need to be examining um, our patients by asking them to, to show us the whole limb so that we can uh, formulate and undertake that proper examination and assessment. We need to be mindful of the fact that if we're compressing just below the knee, we could push fluid into those areas if it isn't already there, as I've said. But actually from the start, um, we need to be treating those areas and we need to gain the skills in order to do that and if I'm a patient and somebody's suggesting that I have below knee stockings or below knee um, compression um, and I know that I've got swelling above the knee or I think I have um, and I think my toes are susceptible to swelling and my foot and I struggle to get shoes on then I'm not going to accept that I'm going to say no um, I want um, access to a full leg including my toes and foot treatment and there's lots of different options as Tess said for managing that. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the big thing is, is I know that you all see this on a daily basis. You see feet like this and, and thighs, knees, legs like this. Um, I think that the, the thing is, is none of us like to think that we're causing harm to our patients. But, but both of these examples are avoidable harm. Yeah. So they genuinely are. And as Becky just said a moment ago, the most important thing is we address any swelling as early as possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Tess. Thank you. There's a few um, comments in, in the web chat um, that I think is it's quite interesting. And there's um, one that I'm going to just answer live. Um, and it's about that it's very difficult for patients to get timely practice nurse appointments. And some of the GP surgeries have opted out of wound management. People have to go to urgent care at the hospital for management, which is a challenge and an ongoing problem. It's, it's very, yes, it, it's just, I'm dumbfounded. <laughs> um, yeah. That that is not acceptable. That is not acceptable at all, Beck. If you, I think I think the universal offer has meant that there's been massive changes. I think that we know that patients are struggling to access care, um, be it in their own home, be it in a, a an ambulatory setting, um, in outpatients. And you know, the last place that we want patients with a lower limb wound um, rocking up is to A and E. But you can totally understand as an individual if you can't access that care, what do you do? Um, and I think that um, this is really sounded the alarm um, to use leg mat legs matters. Um, harm alarm um, analogy that we need to make sure that we are getting that immediate and necessary care wherever that patient may be seen hopefully in a primary care outpatient setting where things are not at crisis point where hopefully it's more mild and, and uncomplicated um, at that time um, but very shocking I agree yeah I'm going to uh, I just want to add to that as well that again um, lots of um, you know I do lots of joint patient visits with practice nurses and um, all of the industry partners are happy to do that they have clinical advisors um, it's something I do on a regular basis and I think the hardest thing for practice nurses is is 
knowing what compression products are out there and knowing how to measure for them. So, you know, I can only encourage you to explore, um, utilize the free resources that are that are out there. Um, there's several comments in here about, you know, accessing, accessing care, how do they get repeat prescriptions and it really does depend on your local ICB, your local trust. So what your protocols are in your area. So as Becky said, there are some areas um, across the UK that have no uh, services for non-cancer related lymphedema. So, you know, patients like you would see in the photos that are up on the screen now, mm -hmm. where do these patients go? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that it's, it, we need to upskill ourselves mm -hmm. um, and utilize the free resources available to us. Absolutely, absolutely. I think we'll answer some more of the questions nearer the end because I'm hoping that <laughs> a couple of the case studies will actually help towards that. So I'm going to just go through case, a few case studies. So this case study was published by Hansen um, in the 2024 um supplement uh, you'll be able to find find the reference for that and this was a 63 year old female who got a four year history of bilateral secondary lymphedema due, due to chronic venous insufficiency and limb dependency so she'd got that edema she'd also got wounds she'd over three years had various treatments with short stretch uh, compression bandaging two to three times a week. Um, but the exudate level from her legs was really high. So she was referred to a lymphedema team who prescribed uh, one variation of an adjustable compression wrap, which the patient would not use until the ulcers were healed. So again, it was that discussion with the patient and, and um working with the, the patient's anxieties. So this the wounds were treated with wound irrigation um, and some debridement. Um, and then she was put into the wraps, but within one month of using those wraps, her voice ulcers had reoccurred. So she was strict, switched back into short stretch bandaging. So she presented to a clinic 20 months after her first ulceration. She'd got 90% slough, 10% granulation, but had got biofilm and maceration evident to the peri, peri wound area. So this was ongoing three, four year history. So it's quite a long time to be living with this and going through that care. Now her measurements, which um, is really interesting, she, she her measurements are on this slide, but this patient was educated so that reassurance was given um, as to using a different type of wrap prior to wound healing. And the rationale behind that in that it, it, it's similar to a short stretch bandage, it will do what the bandage will do, but will allow us to um, it take less time, it'll allow us to access the skin for skin care. Um, so they decided to use compression wraps. And by week two, the two small, smaller wounds on the patient's leg had healed. Um, the other wounds were reducing in size. And by week eight of being treated, this patient had all of her wounds healed. But if you can see on the slide, the picture's slightly in the way, she'd had reductions of, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to click to that. She had reductions of 25 and 21 centimeters on both calves. So you treat the edema and it helps to heal the wounds. She'd also had um, reductions at the ankles and the healing and the reduction for her was resulted in her being really more, much more positive about her long-term management of her legs. And she actually continued to use those wraps as her management with her discharge passport there that was to do with skincare, exercise and, and managing with those wraps. So, so that's 
just one thing to, to sort of think about. The other thing is about getting compression right. Now, I'm hoping that this will answer some of the questions in the chat. So this patient is my patient. Um, he was a 68-year-old gentleman who had got lymphedema secondary to obesity. There was no other underlying cause that, that could have caught, caused that. These photographs will show you the um, how his skin was. So he'd got extensive skin changes, lots of hyperkeratosis and papillomatosis. He'd also got swollen toes. He'd got reduced mobility due to arthritis, but also due to his weight. Um, he used a mobility scooter. He lived in a uh, sheltered housing, but was mobile around his flat and self-caring. But he came to me because he was unable to access care, at, um, adequate care, and was at the end of his tether. He'd had a recent DVT and episodes of cellulitis. So this gentleman present, presented to me, he'd never had any compression other than bandaging for a previous wound, which was then, once the wound was healed, nothing, nothing was put on. Um, his goals for him were very much about his daughter who had got uh, special educational needs, but lived independently herself. And he really just wanted to be able to take her on a driving holiday. He was a widow and it was something that they do regularly over the years, but he wasn't able to do that. So we'd got lots of issues when, when I saw him. It was the struggling to bend down. I, I was watching him walk, thinking, OK, how can I treat these legs, keep him mobile and make sure that I get him able to manage long term with his compression and when he struggles to bend down and he's got arthritis so the answer to the questions are coming <laughs> so this was after three weeks of treatment with short stretch multi-layer lymphedema bandaging and i did it three times a week at the time i chose because i i have those skills to bandage his toes um, he'd got athlete's foot, so we were treating him for tinea pedis. Um, we were doing regular skin care, and I was also concerned about not bandaging above knee. So because of his mobility and his obesity, we decided to put him in knee and thigh wraps. So we just bandaged um, below the knee. But I wanted, I chose to use a bandage purely to try and correct those skin changes and really force that edema out really quickly. We discussed his weight management and he had chosen to go on a diet. We discussed his ability to don and doff garments. So I talked him through the different applicators that were available. And because of his inability to bend down to his feet, he had got a long handled sponge and a brush so that he could do his skincare, but he also we also looked to get in him the type of applicator that is a frame so that he'd got long handles so that he could pull that onto his foot. The other thing that I um, was concerned about was the fact that actually he needed quite a high level of compression to stop that from coming back. But I had to balance that with his ability to be able to get them on and off. So I chose to um, put him in a double layer of compression hosiery. And that was, I did a class one flat knit thigh length garment to both legs. And then I layered with a class one below knee open toe flat knit so that we had got that good pressure on his below knees, but he could still manage his thighs. We could have decided to put zips in, but again, he hadn't got the dexterity to pull the garment together to get the zips up. Um, and yeah, so, so that is what worked for him. And these are um, his limb volume measurements that I'd taken um, at pre treatment and then at the end of week four 
um, and you can see him there in his compression garments. Um, we ended up losing nearly six, seven, six and a half litres of fluid and 3.5 to 4.6 centimetres off his legs and feet. So that for him was great. The last time I spoke to him, he'd taken his daughter on a driving holiday to France, which was just really special. And then this was him. He's getting a little bit of slippage there on his hosiery. So we were looking at how we could deal with that. Um, but he continues with this. He's had no more DVTs. He's had no more episodes of cellulitis. Um, he does watch his toes. And I think it's that thing of just taking that time to for us to work as a team to, for me to listen to him and for him to understand why I was suggesting what I was suggesting, it it's meant that his long-term treatment has been really good. And we know that getting that good evidence-based effective treatment is going to be, it's going to ultimately limit the resources that we need to use. It reduces the burden on the NHS and reduces the episodes of cellulitis. So it's it's really important that um, we think about that. So I hope that's helped. So to conclude the session, I mean, this is just, I mean, we could talk for hours, but I'm not sure everybody would want to stay online all night. Um, with, I hope that this presentation has highlighted just some of the barriers to effective leg care that are apparent throughout the patient journey. And that's from, even in the chat, getting that, proper assessment to being able to utilize uh, the proper treatment and then that ongoing care. Um, we know as clinicians that it's not acceptable and I really applaud and I know we all do Legs Matter for their campaigning and their highlighting and the 10 point plan we should all be referencing that because we have a duty of care to reduce these barriers and ensure that we have the knowledge and skills to promote effective evidence-based care and to get that knowledge and skills as as Tess said the companies if you can't access um training elsewhere that the companies we all have CPD accredited training that is very much taught by people who are still in cl clinical practice and understand the challenges of teaching our, um, treating our groups of, of patients. So I think the other thing is, is we've got to really ensure that our patients are included in the decision-making process and understand their care and have access to all the necessary information that, that they need. So I hope you find that, that interesting. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to go back to my lovely colleagues and say, give me one take-home message from this session. What's your take-home message? <laughs> oh, who's on mute? Me. So for me, I think um, the take-home message is everybody should be accessing and utilising the Legs Matter 10-point plan. Um, and we should be engaging our patients right from the very start. Uh, we should be intervening as early as possible with any signs, signs of edema. And lastly, managing the whole limb and not just the lower limb. That's it from me. Oh, thank you, Tess. Beth? <laughs> I think it's really clear that there's no one compression option for every patient. I think the case examples that you shared, I think the information that Tess shared, I don't think it's surprising that our generalist colleagues and us as patients and public can't get our head around the complexity of the number of components that are available, the number of uh, fabrics, colours, styles, uh, stiffness levels, everything else. Uh, I think we should use some of the hosiery selection tools, get used to them um, and understand those more. And then just stick with some real basics of having, you know, um, a, a low working pressure, high resting, sorry, a high resting high working pressure, low resting <laughs> pressure um, for a bandage um, and thinking about our high stiffness and, and flat knits where appropriate. And I think my key take home um, is that 
please don't ignore um, even the subtle changes and the cues from patients. Stop talking about chronic edema being different to lymphedema. Um, mm -hmm. They're one and the same thing, as we said. And please, please, please give lymphedema, uh, li give lymphorrhea um, the precedence that it really deserves and treat it as a wound just like any other lower limb wound, um, rather than just uh, applying a pad uh, and a stockinette. Thank you. I think my take home message is very much that let's not rest on our laurels. Let, let's not just let the patient journey during active treatment continue for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. It can be treated pretty quickly and effectively keep reviewing and then keep escalating so yes right shall we check see if we've answered if there's any more questions <laughs> <laughs> i've managed uh, to answer a few as okay. as uh, in the chat mm -hmm. good good um, uh, and i think any that we don't have time to pick up we will certainly be reaching out to you to absolutely, absolutely. Um, to answer those questions okay yeah i can't i can't see any I think there was one in there about hypoallergenic products, which was really interesting because I think that oh. components of, of products is really interesting and you guys will have far more of a say on that. But there are latex free products that are out on, on yeah. FB10. Um, yeah. And I think that it's really about making sure that patients have the opportunity to be patch tested to see whether their allergies um, are specifically related to that particular bandage um, or dressing component um, and actually looking at whether there are um, underlayers that can be used use sometimes so things yeah. like silk stockings yeah. um, uh, that can be utilized if patients have a sensitivity but I think that's a really really important question that somebody's raised and something yeah. that I think we'll see more of uh, and more patients developing yeah. sensitivities over time uh, I, I would like to thank everyone um, who's commented everyone who's asked a question uh, or made a comment we've got a really informed audience which is amazing uh, and I really hope that you cascade some of your great uh, tips and tricks and anything that you have taken from the website to your colleagues um, and friends and family as well yes thank you fabulous that was fabulous becky thank you for that thank you so if there is oh, i think there's one more one more if i've got time uh, and it's to do with amputees and um, and i think it's that um about companies making compression wraps for amputees contact the companies because they they, they have lots of weird and wonderful solutions to um yeah managing those that are, have an amput amputation so definitely um what else uh i've discussed access to donning and doffing aids is really really important and everybody that i ask for to, to wear compression they get even down to rubber gloves they don't have to be expensive. They can be gardening gloves are really useful for, for helping to get that hosiery on and off. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you, everybody. Happy Legs Matter Week and keep spreading the word.